It is 10 o'clock. Good morning. I'm Lucas Panzica from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. The bracket is out for the 2024 NCAA tournament, and the Tennessee Vols are the two seed in the Midwest region. They will take on St. Peter's on Thursday night in Charlotte. The second round matchup that would be against the winner of the 7-10 game in the Midwest. Texas is the seven seed, and they await their opponent as Virginia and Colorado State will face off in a play-in game. Whoever comes out of that situation will face the winner between Tennessee and St. Peter's. Eight SEC teams made the cut. Auburn a four seed in the East after routing Florida in the SEC championship game Sunday. The one seeds are UConn, Houston, North Carolina, and Purdue. Over the weekend, the Pittsburgh Steelers acquired Bears quarterback Justin Fields in a trade, sending a 2025 six-rounder to Chicago that could become a fourth if Fields plays 51% or more of the snaps in 2024. The Steelers signed Russell Wilson in free agency earlier this offseason. Also, the Tennessee Titans on Friday released left tackle Andre Dillard. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 the zone. All right, seriously, Lucas, what the hell am I going to have to do to get the John Robinson intro out of here? It's been almost two years. What are we doing? You want to cut a deal? Yes. You start showing up before 10.01, we'll take it right out. Why? We'll take it right out. What That's all you got to do. I'm here. That's all you got to do. I was here at 10.01. I was here while you were doing your, I walked in as you were giving your breaking sports news update, which oftentimes does not include the most breaking sports news in it, what difference does it make if I'm here at 10.01 versus 9.59 to hear John Robinson fired from damn near two years ago in the intro to the show? You go, you keep complaining. I've given you my terms. <laughs> what time do you want me here? You want to spend more time with me? I don't feel like this is a winning proposition for you. I want you in that green room waiting patiently, sitting straight up with both hands in your lap at 9.42 every morning. 9.42? These are my terms. I, have, I haven't I have left the house at 9.42, I think, since we started the radio show. And the the later you start showing up, I'm going to keep adding more Fire Titans <laughs> personnel. Like you're you're going to hear Rustin Webster in the open. The, oh, my God. I, I don't even know if you know who that is. I do know who Rustin Webster <laughs> is. He was here when I got here. <laughs> Good morning. Hope you had a great weekend. It's lovely to have you guys here with us. Uh, We are here with you until 1 o'clock, no matter if I show up at 9.59, 9.42, 10.01, whatever the case may be. We're here for the start of the show. We're lovely. It's lovely to have you here with us. We have brackets. Uh, Despite Tennessee pooping the bed on Friday against Mississippi State, you were at the arena the entire time. I got there, I don't know, it was probably... 10, 20 minutes into the start of the game. Oh, so it was over. Yeah. (laughs) I was sitting in the media workroom with Ramon because I'd just come over from the facility. We did the Calvin Ridley press conference, and we had Calvin Ridley on the show. It was great, by the way. You can go check all of that out uh, via the podcast or the YouTube channel. But I walked upstairs into the concourse and... Just saw a bunch of dejected volunteers fans. I saw our friend uh, Madison Blevins, not her, but I saw her entire family all wearing their orange, all staring just with vitriol in their faces at two things. One, they couldn't buy booze on the main concourse at Bridgestone Arena. Is that new? No, that's always been a thing. Why is that a thing? It's the SEC tournament. It's always been a thing at the SEC tournament. Explain to me. Is but there... the SEC schools are like just now selling alcohol in stadiums. Like Georgia is just now selling alcohol at Sanford Stadium. So, but they were selling it on the fourth floor and they were selling it in the restaurants. Why the hell can't they sell yeah, it in the like, main I concourse? Yeah, I think like the Bet MGM Lounge, you go, it's it's kind of its own thing. You can, you know, but you got to keep it in there. But yeah, on the concourse walking around, SEC sanctions event, uh, no. You okay. Can't. So pissed about the booze situation. And then pissed about the fact that they just could do nothing against Mississippi State, who was physically dominating them 
uh, in ways that it was significantly different. What they lose by five the first time that uh, Mississippi State and the Vols played? Yeah, it was a close game. Mississippi State uh, did a lot more damage from three in that game than they did on Friday. And Dalton Connect had a great night, had 28 points, kind of tried to help lift Tennessee on the road at the hump. It was Tennessee's first SEC loss, but it was not like Friday where Tennessee's just run off the court. And we have acted like, well, you know, for this team, every Tennessee loss has been Kentucky where Reed Shepard goes seven of 10 from three or Wade Taylor, the fifth makes his first five, three pointers at home against Texas A&M. And it's like, okay, whatever. It's one of those days, right? They're, they're going to get some stuff down low. They're going to hit a bunch of big shots on the outside. That's the recipe to beating Tennessee. Tennessee hit more threes than Mississippi State on Friday, and Tennessee was not shooting well from three. They beat Tennessee up down low, 42 to 14 in the paint. 42 to 14. Got whatever they wanted. So disappointing. To say the least, on Friday, now the real tournament begins because we have actual brackets. I have a physical bracket in front of me. And St. Peter's, the mighty Peacocks, who have upset SEC teams before, is the first-round opponent for the Vols, who will get begin play on Thursday in Charlotte as a part of the Midwest region. Now, we talked about this. They won the SEC in the regular season. We weren't really going to be too bent out of shape if they went out of the SEC tournament early. But to lose that way on the first day as the number one seed, and listen, it was a weird tournament. Auburn ended up winning it. Auburn's a good basketball team. If you'd have picked Auburn to win the SEC tournament, you probably would have uh, you, you would have been in, in good standing, right? But the way Kentucky lost, the way Tennessee lost, the way that Alabama lost, it was a weird tournament for a lot of the teams that should have had better runs than they did. How much am I to read into what Tennessee did against Mississippi State versus the sample size of the entire regular season? Lucas, what is your level of BVS today? What is the audience level of BVS today? The the GOAT, Leland Leland Statham at News Channel 5, tweeted us about his level of BVS. I had no idea Leland listened to the show. This is something that's palpable because it's Rick Barnes, it's tournament time, and Friday is technically postseason play. So what am I to do with the level of BVS today? Because I'm not really sure what to tell Vols fans because they were phenomenal (laughs) all during the regular season. And they just laid down, laid down and got pushed around for the entirety of that game. And yet I'm going to, at one point, I looked up. We were at the Bet MGM Lounge with our with our buddy Preston. I looked up at the looked up at the screen. I was like, "Oh, they got it within twenty. Congratulations to them!" And Vols fans started getting back into it a little bit, just because they're bored. They have nothing else to do. Many of them took off. Many of you took off work on Friday to go watch that slop, and now you're probably heading into this first round game on Thursday against St. Peter's, doing a little pearl clutching as a number two overall seed. It's it's terrible. <laughs> you are hoarse. <laughs> it's terrible. Well, you know, St. Patty's weekend. It's a long um, weekend. Yeah, it going into the tournament on two straight losses is not great. And the way you played on Friday, the worst performance by a Tennessee basketball team in, a, I'm willing to say, a couple years. I don't know the last time that they really just laid down like that. Turnover after turnover. There was one spell, a Tennessee possession, where Zakai Ziegler got off like three three-pointers in the same possession. That just encapsulated that entire game because Tennessee kept getting the offensive rebounds and kickouts. Ziegler open three, Ziegler open three. One of them airballed. One of them hit the side of the backboard. And this was early first half. And that's when I said, oh, they're not in it today. This is just not happening. I I don't know what the deal was. Rick Barnes said at halftime, he told his team, I didn't recognize that team. I've never seen that team. We hadn't seen that team all year. We haven't seen that team in a a couple years, it feels like. Like, Tennessee was not as good last year as it is this season, but they did not have a bottoming out type of single game performance at any point last season the way they did on Friday. That was weird to look at. The BVS, like the St. Peter's thing, doesn't necessarily give me the BVS. I actually love the St. Peter's matchup because they had their Cinderella run. 
How often do you see these teams, the likes of the St. Peter's Peacocks? Oh, I can't wait to replay this Friday. <laughs> <laughs> this very... I'm, at, I'm out of town on Friday. It's going to be you. So I'm now, I'm oh, now no. relying on this you. This is to very hold dangerous your, territory. To hold I'm yourself accountable. Into, yes. No, no, no. Go ahead. Lean into it. Get no, chesty. I, I'm going to lean in. Get chesty with the Peacocks. I dare you. The Peacocks, two years ago, they beat Kentucky. They beat Murray State. They beat Purdue. They made it all the way to the Elite Eight, where I think they lost. Oh, who did they lose to? North Carolina is the team they eventually lost to. How often do you see schools like the Peacocks that have like 500 people and have a gym that's smaller than the majority of high schools in Middle Tennessee? Keep going. Go on these runs twice in a three-year span? No, 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 no. I don't think so. They had their time. Goodbye, Peacocks. You're not going to fly in March this year. I love the St. Peter's matchup. The Texas, potential Texas matchup is interesting. If you move on to the second round and Texas is able to beat whoever comes out of the Virginia-Colorado State game because there's obviously the Barnes connection there. And the school that fired Rick Barnes for lack of tournament success would be slightly poetic for him to beat them in the second round to get to the Sweet 16, beat his former assistant, Rodney Hood. So the BVS is there. March brings around BVS. March is the most terrifying time of year. I love it. For a college basketball Because game, Indiana's isn't it? not in it. It's just so, like, it just pulls at every nervous, like, string in your body. I, it just, it is so excruciating, but awesome. I love it. It's amazing. But I don't know. I feel like I get more nervous for March Madness basketball games than, than almost any other sporting event. I because swear. of who your coach is. No, but that's just a perpetual thing. No, like, that's but going, there has to be a little bit of that. There has to be a little bit oh, of that. Sure, absolutely. And Until like, such time as he has a winning record yeah, yeah. No, the in ring, the tournament, there's Rick no benefit Barnes of the doubt. has a role, yeah. of pl- role to play there. And I joke about Indiana being terrible and not being in the tournament and declining the NIT to focus on recruiting because God knows Mike Woodson needs to. Uh, but it does give you a level of freedom when your team's not in it and you can just enjoy the basketball, just enjoy the upsets. But, of course, you're a number two overall seed and you're coming off two straight losses to head into the tournament to teams that – I mean, Kentucky at the end of the regular season, I don't I don't want to discount it because it's a home game. Mississippi State at Bridgestone, you could not have had a friendlier atmosphere than the one that was presented to you. And by the way, the crowds at Bridgestone all weekend were awesome. Awesome to see. From Vanderbilt and Arkansas on Wednesday night through the championship game on Sunday. This is why Nat and this is why Nashville needs to have this thing. Not just uh, not just for the term of the contract. I think they re up for what like six or seven more years, um, but and honestly in perpetuity, just because it's a great place for us to host this thing. I think that when you have you have given yourself a level of expectation this year, if you are a Vols basketball fan, that exceeds any other previous year. Right? We're talking about. They have to make the Sweet 16 at minimum. And I'm not saying, or Rick Barnes is done or anything like that. Nobody's nobody's going that far. But, like, seriously, you have to wonder if this person is capable of navigating the most important time of year instead of this Jekyll and Hyde nonsense that you continue to get year in and year out. And I know there's a variety of different reasons, and I know all these results are not the same. But the last thing that I want to hear from Rick Barnes, of all people, is the same thing that I'm saying, which is, what is this team? I've not seen this team all year long. I don't want to hear for that, that from the coach, even if it's true. <laughs> no, you're the person tasked with figuring it out. Now, a lot of one seeds in conference tournaments are having these exact conversations, right, after last weekend. Sure. 17 one seeds lost in their conference tournaments. People, you- by the way, are questioning your bravado in the FNM Bank chat. Pat McGrath on YouTube <laughs> says, Lucas sounds threatened by the Peacocks. I, I, he's Pat, he's trying to talk us into it as much as he's trying to talk himself into it. There's probably some level of truth to that. But what would Rick Barnes have to do this year? What would Tennessee have to do, do you think, to shed the Rick Barnes can't win in March sort of stigma? Like, made the Sweet 16 last year. Elite 8. So, Elite 8 or nothing else? Elite 8 for the first time in program history. Okay. Like, that. that's fair. I think a Sweet 16 and then an Elite 8 in the following year is, like, kind of finally dispels that stuff. But we'll see. Obviously, you have got to get past the opening weekend. If you don't, it will be a major disappointment and failure for this program. 615-737-1045. I do sound hoarse. God. 
Long weekend. Took a cheese grater to your vocal cords yesterday. Well, Bert, not yesterday. Bert on Saturday all day. Oh, blame it on Bert. It's Bert's fault. You know who sounded fine this morning? Bert. Yeah, sounded but Bert like sounds himself. like hell every day. That's right. He's, 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 he, he is perpetually smothered in cigarette smoke. It's impossible for him to sound good, so he just set the level of the, the level of expectation very, very low. Anyway. Uh, Andre Dillard is gone. The Titans still have needs. Free agency continues. What's the biggest hole remaining on the roster? We'll talk about that. There's also some reporting. I don't know if you saw what happened with the Legereus Sneed stuff this weekend in Indianapolis, but that's a whole mess, too. We'll talk about it coming up next. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone.
so quickly, I misspoke. Tennessee, of course, has been to the Elite Eight under Bruce Pearl. They lost to Draymond Green in Michigan State back in 2010. Thank you guys for catching that one. They have never been to the Final Four in program history. 615-737-1045 is the number. You can talk hoops if you want. We'll get into some Titan stuff, too. Free agency continues. Some signings, uh, a little lower-level stuff, second, third-wave stuff over the weekend into today. Terry in Goodlitzville is up first. Hey, Terry. How you doing, gentlemen? Great. I'm going to talk about something I don't get to talk about very often in March, and that's Nebraska basketball. No, oh, I don't want to talk about <laughs> Nebraska basketball. Why would you call hey, me, Terry? Hey. Because a sick and twisted thing, uh, last week we lost our athletic director, Lane Kiffin style, just kind of folded out and went to Texas A&M. Yep. And if you look, our first round in the tournament, we play Texas A&M. And if you look at the women's tournament, the first round in Nebraska's women, they play Texas A&M. So I just wanted to say there is a little dark and twisted on the selection committee. Very interesting little tidbit, but that's all. I'll hang up, and and like I said, don't get to talk Nebraska basketball very often in March. Well, that was much more innocent than I expected because, of course, Indiana lost to Nebraska in the Big Ten tournament, and Uh, I've been retching over that for a couple of days. And not, I mean, that was a blowout. My goodness. So bad. Uh, Yeah, Trev Alberts, the former Nebraska AD, takes over at A&M. So, yeah, the, the, (laughs) the committee... Pairing that up in men's and women's, like, come on. I guess I guess coincidence, but that could be an interesting matchup. That could be a very interesting matchup. Did you uh so what were you doing yesterday? Have you already filled out a bracket or are you waiting? I have not. I, I never fill it out right after the selection show because then that gives me like four days to go back and and redo a bunch tinker. of picks and tinker. I'm I'm a tinkerer. So I, I'm going to sit and fill it out. Probably on like Wednesday or something, and give myself as little time as possible to second guess and rethink. Because typically that's where things really go wrong. Uh, UConn's path is insane. There is some imbalance to this bracket, I feel like. Like, I was perplexed by Auburn winning the SEC championship and getting a four seed out of it. Yeah, that was surprising for sure. And so that leaves UConn as the number one overall seed. Let's say in that East bracket that every higher seed wins. That means UConn will have to go through the likes of Iowa State as the two seed, who a lot of people thought should be the one or be a one after they routed Houston in the Big 12. Illinois, the three seed, Big Ten champs. Auburn, the four seed. Oh, buddy, FAU Those are in the second round, champions. potentially. Those are all, and then, uh, yeah. And then FAU, FAU is a legit program when it comes to college basketball. I wanted Mike Woodson fired so they could hire Dusty May. I mean, the amount of conference champions that are in here, Drake is a dangerous 10 seed out of the Missouri Valley. Yale won the Ivy League in crazy fashion, by the way, uh, with a buzzer-beating layup against Brown. That game was really fun to watch yesterday. So, Man, UConn got a tough draw as the number one overall one seed to have to fight through the likes of potentially Iowa State and Illinois. Well, they don't want to just gift them a a repeat championship. Sure. I mean, they had, I mean, they cruised last year. They cruised all the way to the championship game. Not one of those games was close. So we'll talk more hoops later. Slay will be on in the noon hour. Uh, He, God love him. He was on television all weekend long, caught a flight yesterday after they did the pregame SEC tournament championship coverage from Bridgestone, got on a flight, went to Charlotte, did a whole bracket breakdown with Peter Burns and a couple other people on the SEC network. He's getting a flight back in the noon hour and jumping on with us at, at about 1230. So we're greatly appreciative of Slay's time today. The only person with that kind of energy to do all of these things is Ron Slay. So we'll look forward to having him, and we'll talk a little Tennessee then, of course, too. Um, your national Andre Dillard nightmare is over. That happened, I don't know, Friday afternoon at about 3. Titans officially release him. No post-June 1st designation, so they said, take your money, take our money, and get the hell out of here. They're just going to eat the cap hit in one year instead of pushing it off into another. It does create an interesting question. Because Jalen Duncan is the only player with experience. I mean, I guess Raidens has played a little left tackle before, but they seem, you know, at least the last coaching staff was reticent to put him there. 
is tackle the greatest need on the roster because to look at that defense right now, Chidobia Wuze and uh, Kenneth Murray as their defensive signing so far, they do not inspire great confidence. Wuze is a, a solid player, but he's dealt with a lot of injury. Mur- Murray is an underperforming former first-round pick. The defense is kind of scary after Jeff Harold and Armani Hooker. In, in a bad way. Yeah, no, yeah, not, not in a way that we're typically not, talking about. Not the scary Titan. like they have been in the past. <laughs> Isn't it funny that Titans fans have, you know, wished for, you know, modernized football. Let us play offense. Let us get a real 2024 bona fide passing game. Oh, my God. What does the defense look like? Uh, former Saints offensive lineman Andres Pete visits today. That's a guy that has played left tackle out of necessity in New Orleans, but He's a guard has made a career out of being an interior guy. He's a guard. And, and had a good career. Yeah, doing that. no, he's he's New Orleans has had a great offensive line group for quite some time, but he's he's at the end of his career. So this would be, you know, you could probably get replacement level starting play out of him. He'd be better than Brunskill, for example. But yeah, left tackle was the biggest hole at the start of the offseason and it hasn't been addressed. So it remains the biggest hole on the roster, right? Yes. But is one position versus basically the entire defense. Does one position outweigh the needs that you have all over the place on the other side of the ball? It is basically my point here. Not to say that we're, it's still pre-draft, right? They can address all these things, but I didn't think, I, I'm sure most Titans fans probably didn't think that they were going to address a great number of defensive needs heading into this year's draft, did they? Yeah, I mean, the reality is you were never going to check every box this offseason. Like no. This was never a one-off season rebuild, roster good to go at the start of 2024. We've talked about this plenty of times. I'm just saying, like, I am curious to see how much of this, because defensive linemen keep signing with teams left and right, and none of them are coming to the Titans. Jerome Baker did not sign with the Titans. The inside linebacker who left here, had a visit, left here, got a contract in Seattle, will play for Mike McDonald, the new head coach there. Denard Wilson, you know, there are there are three players, four in McCreary. I'll give you McCreary. Four players of consequence on the defense. The rest are dudes who have not made an impact. Elijah Molden may have shown something in the back half of his rookie year. For the most part, Elijah Molden has been a non-factor. Rashad Weaver, we've talked about these guys before. I don't know who the hell is going to play next to Jeff Simmons on the defensive line. They have to figure that out very, very quickly. And this is not a great defensive line draft. So, the left tackle is, of course, a need. The left tackle will be addressed. It's not like they're going to roll into 2024 with Jalen Duncan or Dylan Radens. But it's it's a little, it's enough to make you a little nervous, isn't it? Just kind of, or at least curious, what's the plan here? I have a proposition. I get another one? I think two the, segments, two propositions? I, I think the Titans should retire the number 71. <laughs> After releasing Andre Dillard, Dennis Staley and Andre Dillard. Let, did it. Let's normalize that. How many? How many different players have worn seventy one for the Titans? I'm, I'll let you look that up. But we should normalize that. We have Hall of Fame number retirements that that number is heralded because of the person that wore it so much so that nobody else can wear that number for that franchise again. We should do that in the opposite direction. Dennis Kelly. We're 71. Yeah, that's true. Dennis Kelly was good here. Um, Yeah, these are a bunch of... Fr- Pillar. Zach Pillar. Pillar wore 71. Yep. Big, big time Ruse. player. And, yeah, I'm like, oh, franchise legend. Okay, well, we can... So, maybe you could retire it for two reasons. There have been a bunch of people who've played well in that jersey, but the last two have been nightmarish. Oof. <laughs> that's, that's a Malik Neighbors level. Oof. Yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm curious to see... It doesn't mean that they don't have a plan. I'm sure they have a plan. They've been in on a couple of these players, and they're trying to figure out what the best way to approach it is. I'm just saying Kenneth uh, Murray and Shadobi Awuze are not enough. Even though I think Awuze, you know, provided he stay healthy, and that's not a given. Wait, Pillar didn't wear 71. Zach Pillar wore 69 with the Titans. Okay. Uh, I'm being lied to then by pro football reference. Maybe with a different team he did. Not with the Titans. Mm, This is all players. It says on Pro Football Reference, all players to wear number 71 for the Houston Oilers, Tennessee Oilers, Tennessee Titans franchise. Did he at any point in his career, maybe when he got here first? I don't know. He's on the list. Somebody named Pete Davidson as well in 1960. Not that Pete Davidson. 
But uh, as you look at the roster, left tackle is the single biggest positional hole that you have available. But the defense is concerning. And I don't think that many of us would have thought they would go through the... I mean, it's only the first week. Free agency officially started Wednesday. And there's still a good number of players out there. The Legereus Sneed stuff, have you followed any of that this weekend? I know there was basketball all over the place. and uh, But there was a... Uh, there was a... Uh, a misreported trade by somebody, and I, I don't know this person that works for A to Z Sports, but Destin Adams, who apparently covers the Colts for their A to Z Sports uh, branch, reported that the Sneed trade was happening on Twitter over the weekend. Uh, and I got a bunch of texts about it. I got tagged in a bunch of tweets about it. I hadn't... I. When I had last checked in on Legereus Need and the Titans, it had gone pretty cold after, what? when was our discussion? Tuesday morning? Monday morning? Early in the week. It had cooled off pretty quickly. But this individual um, had reported that Legereus Need was going to be traded to the Colts for, and I want to make sure that I pull up his exact wording here, a second and a third-round pick. And then immediately, the other Indianapolis Colts reporter, Stephen Holder in particular at ESPN, refuting that. Yeah, this is what... So this was the tweet. Sources tell myself and A to Z Sports NFL that the Chiefs and Colts are ironing out the final details on a trade that will send star cornerback Legereus Need to Indianapolis. I'm told the Colts are sending a 2024 third and an additional pick in 2025. Uh, and then, you know, no such trade has happened. And this person is having to walk it back. And Stephen Holder is saying, I've spoken to people at the highest levels of the organization, which essentially is Jim Irsay, even though they're not saying Jim Irsay, saying, yeah, no deal. There's nothing there. Then you have things coming out of Kansas City saying that he might get paid $22 million a year, or that's what he's seeking on his contract extension. Right now he's on the tag, so he's not going to play for that amount. Just under 20 for a one-year franchise um, tag. So... Then The Athletic, this morning, has, uh, fr from Diana Rossini, I think the Colts are probably the front runner on it, the Athletic's NFL podcast. I think the Colts are probably the front runner on it, but I know the Tennessee Titans were really close, which adds up with what I was hearing on Tuesday, which is, yeah, they were trying to figure out compensation. They had stayed in it for the better part of a week. They continue to monitor the situation, but right now that, that trail is pretty cold. I, I does it make that big a difference? I mean, it does make a difference if they do do a deal. And of course, just talking from a local perspective, say in a hypothetical world, the Titans end up with Legereus Need, and we'll see what that might cost for whatever team would trade for him. Is that enough to make you feel consequentially better about the defense? With McCreary, with Amani, you still don't have another safety, and they've been, you know, sniffing around a bunch of veteran safeties, but have yet to sign any of them. Does Legereus Sneed, especially for that potential price tag, make you feel that much better about the defense? I imagine Titans fans would be wringing their hands a little bit, being like, oh, but is it worth the money and what we gave up? Whatever whatever you give up. I'm sure people are going to be looking around, but there are so many needs. I'd rather have more up front that can affect the quarterback and be lacking on the back end than vice versa. Now, that's an interesting proposition, because to hear Denard Wilson tell it, it, and he didn't exactly say this in his in his press conference, but it sounds like his preference would be to build from back to front, which is the way that John Robinson went about it, and correctly, by the way. This was the good John Robinson years when he retooled the secondary, when he drafted Byard, when he got Kenny Vaccaro, when he got Logan Ryan, Malcolm Butler, uh, and the rest, Adore Jackson, MMCMB, the whole thing. And I'm sure it depends on who you ask. People have different football philosophies. I think Denard Wilson's, and I don't want to. I don't want to speak for him, but it sounded from his press conference like he he might take the opposite approach from you. Now, does that change your thinking at all? It shouldn't. You can have whatever opinion you want to. Chef Ran on the F and M Bing chat says Luke is trying to play Vrabel ball. So affecting the quarterback is Vrabel ball. I think it's just football. 
right? I mean, Blaine talks about this all the time. The caliber of athlete at wide receiver in the NFL right now is simply too high to not be able to affect the quarterback and think you're going to have any success whatsoever, no matter how good your defensive back group is. And the problem is the front's not just the front. Guys, I don't know if, like, the Kenneth Murray stuff and and talking to people and watching a little more of him since we've talked to Mike Herndon about it, and, you know, I don't have to do the whole Rashawn Evans 2.0 bit again. But, like, it's a legitimate concern. He may he may do well in a better uh, – and he may do better in a different system. He may have not been comfortable or not been, you know, up to par for whatever they were trying to run with Brandon Staley. But I, that's not a good player to date. He's a good athlete. He's a great athlete. But he's not a good football player yet. Owuze is a solid corner when he's healthy, but he's had a variety of different injuries in his career. You don't have linebackers. You you have you have Jeff and you have Harold. That's really it. And Arden Key. I try not to let my I like Arden. Yeah, but when you're talking about who they have, that's who they have. Like that. That Arden Key is part of who they have. Yeah, but that's like me saying they, like they have Rashad Weaver, okay? Like Arden, Arden doesn't do it for me as a football player yet. Arden's a more productive player than Rashad Weaver. Love him as a quote. I, I, I need to like him better as a football player. So, I, I'm inclined to agree with you, Lucas. And that's not Vrabel ball, by the way. You need good pass rushers. Look at the quarterbacks in the AFC. If you don't have Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow, or Josh Allen, you need to have a defense that's capable of making their lives very, very uncomfortable. It's basically the way that the Titans tried to counter-program the rest of the AFC during Vrabel's career, and that's maybe why you or some might associate it with quote-unquote Vrabel ball. But that's that's the league. You have to make up for your disparity in quarterback play somewhere. Harold and Jeff were a part of the worst third-down defense in NFL history. Jadavion Clowney has been better in other other places since he was with the Tennessee Titans, and of course we know the Vic Beasley experiment failed, and their secondary was bad then too. So there were a variety of different things happening there. But, I I mean, if if you start scoring 27 points a game, but you you can't stop a nosebleed on third down again, these are the kind of things that you have to think about as you look at the ways the ways that different things are being prioritized. Now, again, it's not over. It's March 18th. We're not even a full week into the free agency period. So there's no reason to freak out. But I'm just saying, as we talk about left tackle and the emphasis on left tackle and offensive linemen and offensive line prospects and who are they going to sign in free agency, this, that, and the other, I'm looking around and saying, <laughs> I don't know who's going to be out there on defense for them. But that's, that picture is not very clear at this point. 615-737-1045 is the number if you want to jump in. Speaking of Vrabel Ball, he got a job over the weekend. We'll talk about it coming up next.
Welcome back to the show. Don't forget about the Zone's Million Dollar Bracket Challenge. You can check that out at 1045thezone.com. A great opportunity for you guys to get involved. And listen, I know there are some people who are uh, have strong opinions about nobody cares about your bracket. Don't talk about your bracket, this, that, and the other. Whatever. These are, these are fun things. You don't have to get banana shape about it. I personally don't make a bracket. I enjoy it more when I don't make one. But everybody else in the world does. So, it's a great opportunity. Uh, you can sign up at 1045thezone.com today and register for that Million Dollar Bracket Challenge presented by Scoreboard Bar and Grill. We are also giving away a pair of tickets to see Chris Stapleton at Bridgestone Arena for the best local bracket score. Have you seen Chris Stapleton live? Yes, saw him at Bridgestone a couple years ago when he was with Marcus King. It was phenomenal. Uh, so, like I said, 1045thezone.com today. Uh, who's your upset pick? Give me one. Give me one first-round upset. St. Peter's. I hate you. <laughs> I hate you so much. Oh. What happened? What happened? I'm not going to be here to suffer the consequences. I'm, I'm that was it. lazy. That was lazy by you. That wasn't lazy you at all. You asked asked the no, bracket. no, no. There was no... no you you didn't there have was an answer, no so you just wanted to rip me. that you gave me, you said, give me one. All you said to me was give me one first-round upset. So I did. And then when I fly to L.A. on Friday and don't think of a second again about it, and you have to suffer the consequences of you being chesty about the Peacocks, whatever that looks like, I hope they make you sweat it out on Friday morning. Yeah, uh, late, late Thursday. I mean, it's one of the last, I think, 840 is the tip. That's real light. Tennessee and St. Peter's. In, in Charlotte, which is good, uh, which is close for Tennessee to make the trip. <laughs> Tyler Rogers says that smirk when Buck said St. St. <laughs> Peter's. That's right. I'm going McNeese State. Will Wade. Watch Will Wade just make a crazy run. Will Wade is... He's had a phenomenal season. No. Yes. I had no idea. They this play is... Gonzaga in the first round in the south bracket. Anyway, um, Mike Vrabel got a job on Friday. Did you see what the it, – it's not like a Jim Schwartz role because Schwartz, of course, is in Cleveland um, as the defensive coordinator. And while he was here in Tennessee, he was a senior defensive assistant. Um, but he has been hired to the coaching staff as a coaching and personnel advisor. What do you make of that? Uh, Schwartz was the first person I thought of when I saw this news because mm -hmm. I truly wonder. Remember, Vrabel, Schwartz was at kind of a tough spot. He's talked about it. Was at a tough spot in his life and career when Vrabel came in and, and brought him into Tennessee as a senior defensive assistant. And when Schwartz was introduced as the D.C. in Cleveland, he could not stop giving Vrabel credit for how he helped him at that phase in his life. I wonder if Schwartz walked up to, to Kevin Stefanski and was like, hey, man, let's get – Let's get Mike in here and kind of try to do what Vrabel did for him a few years ago. But it's a different role. Oh, sure. Now, there's a couple other factors here. But, like, what side of the ball do we think Vrabel's going to be working on? All of them. The same thing that he did here. Lucas. Yeah, but he was the head coach here. But I understand. But no, no, no. <laughs> he, could, that, he could work whatever side of the ball he wanted to. Yeah, but nobody else does that. You ask Ramon if Mike Tomlin ever went over and coached offensive linemen. Because you talk to people across the league, and they will tell you that that is a very, very specific Mike Vrabel thing. Players who have been through the league will tell you that that's not the way that most of these people work. I bet he's all over the place. Wait, you think Kevin Stefanski hired former coach of the year Mike Vrabel to just come in and just be a floating assistant to go work with whoever he wants? I don't know. It says coaching and personnel consultant. I'm assuming that's overarching. I mean, you're right. There's no tag to one side of the ball, but... You can't dismiss it that way when that's exactly the thing that he do did here, which is not something that... Re and I'm not going to say that nobody else in the history of being a head coach has done it the way that Mike Vrabel did, but it's very, very unique to him is all I'm saying. Now, there's a couple other factors there too because he's he's from Cleveland. He's a, he grew up a Browns fan. Like this is, his, this is his childhood team, and now he gets the opportunity to, I'm sure, be close to family and, and be around that and go... Go through the whole thing. Um, go to Ohio State games. You think he's going to go to Ohio State games? Our, 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 uh... I'll be in Cleveland this weekend. Should I ask him? <laughs> you should. You should call him. See, see, if, uh, see if he wants to go to an Ohio State game. What are you going to Cleveland for? Megan and I going to Cleveland for a little bit. Her sister has a place there. Ugh. 
Go somewhere else. <laughs> there, there's worse places to be. She's in Ohio, bud. It's slim pickings. If all you right? say so. It's Cleveland, Columbus, and then 50 feet of crap, and then every other town in 50 Ohio. 50 feet of crap. <laughs> so anyway, interesting note over the weekend. Uh, Adam Schefter first reported on Friday while the SEC tournament was going on. Uh, Puka says, maybe Stefanski didn't hire. Now, this, of course, is just speculation in the YouTube chat, by the way. She says, Stefanski maybe didn't hire him. It could have been Haslam wanted it. Speculation, Haslam sees him as a coach in waiting. Now, I... I, I know people that had that reaction. Oh, I, really? I know people that instantly were like, why would you want Mike Vrabel in your shadow? Well, that's the, the exact reason that the Dallas Cowboys didn't do something like that. Because Mike McCarthy, the most pre-fired coach in America, according to our buddy Kevin Clark. Are you not going to find me for that? Oh, what did you say? You said Our, our buddy Kevin Clark. All right. Be consistent. See, you're, the, like, you're like NFL officials. You just you I, throw a flag whenever you feel like throwing a flag. I didn't even hear you say The it. fact that I have to go out of my way to find myself on the radio show is terrible but by you. But you do need it. Like, what, Some kind of oversight. Say, you, can't be, you can't be trusted. Just say ESPN's Kevin Clark. And then people will like. Well, no, but okay, I keep saying so, the ringer's Kevin Clark. I, I keep, sure, I keep but messing way, up the fact like, that he's ESPN. You say now. our buddy Kevin Clark. It just sounds like our buddy that we know, Kevin Clark, that we like see sometimes on weekends. Like, Just say ESPN's Kevin Clark. Maybe so, I do. You don't know my schedule. <laughs> So, Frable's got a job with the Browns. Uh, Speaking of the AFC North, a big trade over the weekend. Lots of quarterback trades at this time of year. We'll talk about the level of quarterback movement. Justin Fields going to Pittsburgh, what it means for Russell Wilson, and why Titans fans should care. Coming up next.
It is 1059. Good morning. I'm Lucas Panzeca from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. The bracket is out for the 2024 NCAA tournament, and the Tennessee Vols are the two seed in the Midwest region. They will take on St. Peter's on Thursday night in Charlotte. The second round matchup would be against the winner of the 7-10 game in the Midwest, Texas is the seven seed. They await their opponent as Virginia and Colorado State will face off in a play-in game. Eight SEC teams made the cut, tied with the Big 12 for the most in the country. Auburn, a four seed in the East after routing Florida in the SEC championship on Sunday. The one seeds are UConn, Houston, North Carolina, and Purdue. Over the weekend, the Steelers acquired Bears quarterback Justin Fields in a trade. They sent a 2025 six-rounder to Chicago. It could become a fourth if Fields plays 51% or more of the snaps in 2024. Titans hosting players for visits this week, including today offensive lineman Andres Pete, defensive end Chase Young, safety Marcus May will all be visiting Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Second hour is here on this Monday. Thanks for hanging out with Lucas and me. We got you till 1, 615-737-1045. Jump in there if you want to. Trades continue in the NFL. Quarterbacks moving all over the place. Talk about the 2022 quarterback class because it's Brock Purdy is about the only redeeming quality at this point with every other player but Malik Willis and Purdy having been moved by their original team. Justin Fields... The latest quarterback to be traded. He goes from the Bears to the Steelers. Now, the compensation is one thing. The situation is another. Did you see what Ian Rappaport had to say about there being four teams, not specifying the teams, but saying that there were four teams interested in Justin Fields' services, and he shut down all the trades but to the Steelers? That, I thought, was, you know, and I'm sure some people would view it as an agent trying to do damage control about Justin Fields being moved for a sixth-round pick after Chicago traded ones to acquire him. We all hyper-focus on the Trey Lance deal and how bad that was, and understandably so, it was terrible. But this is a uh, this is also a pretty bad reflection on the Bears. I don't know. Who is it a worse reflection on, the Bears or Justin Fields to date? There's probably equal parts or equal amounts of blame to go around. And Russell Wilson, of course, is there in Pittsburgh for one point, vet minimum, because Denver is paying $38 million to get Russ off their books. The Fields thing is interesting, whether or not that was actually the level of of maneuvering that he wanted, that Pittsburgh was an ideal landing spot. Do you think Justin Fields is a good player? Yes. I think he is a good athlete and a good football player. That doesn't make him a good NFL quarterback. Well, wait. How would being – he's not Taysom Hill. He's good at running with the ball in his hands. He's very athletic. He's very – he has tools. Less he so has last intangibles. year without a good running game. You could be a good football player and not be a good starting NFL quarterback. He is a good athlete and a good football player. Does not mean he is – a bona fide starter in this league. I don't. Th- I I would push back on that notion. Just because he's a good athlete does not make him a good football player. Because to date, you think so. Your opinion is that Justin Fields is bad at football. I don't think he's good at football at the pro level. I've got no sample size to indicate that he's good at football. But guy, besides a couple of highlight real runs in his rookie season. I mean, Lucas, what is, I, I'm, I'm, what's your argument? I think he is a good football player that has been in a poor situation. And he'll get an opportunity in Pittsburgh. I, like, I, <laughs> Russell Wilson, I'd be surprised if Russell Wilson starts all 17 games in Pittsburgh. But I'm, wait, I'm still on wait and see with Justin Fields. Like, I, I've seen Justin Fields play enough really good football to think he can be a good player. I also compl- Really good football? I need to, like... 
Oh, I'm going back to college. Like I watched him in college. No, I understand, but uh, I'm not. I'm not talking about college. And I and I am not dismissing the Bears for trading him to Pittsburgh. They absolutely made the right decision with Caleb Williams sitting there in their lap. But I think Justin Fields still has a chance to be a good quarterback. He's not yet, but I think he still has an opportunity to be. So, like by that logic, Malik Willis is a good athlete, is a good football player. But Malik, not a good quarterback. Malik is different. Justin Fields. Why is he different? Because Justin Fields has shown, I think Justin Fields has shown that he belongs, that there's something there more so than Malik Willis. Much, much more so. I, I would agree with that notion, yeah. but by your premise, you understand why I'm running it through that prism. So Fields goes to Pittsburgh for a sixth round pick. And Russell Wilson, you know. I, it's not guaranteed that he's the week one starter by any stretch of the imagination, but that's how we imagine the depth chart starting out by, you know, voluntary work and OTAs and probably at the start of training camp. We'll see how much. Is it Steelers country? Let's ride. I mean, they do call themselves Steelers country. Yeah, we need to. We need him to. I hope they lean into that. Him? Yes. And they do another one for Steelers country. Well, is there a more intentionally fake human being than Russell Wilson in professional sports that would lean no, into something like that. Probably not. What do you think he's like in real life? Um, it can't be that. I refuse to believe that he's But that. I believe that he he loves the attention, so something like that would be would go all over the place. I mean, we would definitely use it. <laughs> uh, Michael on the FNM Bank chat says, Fields is not as bad as you're making him out to be. Comparing Malik and Justin Fields is insanity. Jibo says, come on, he's a starter. Not a great one, but the dude can play. Mm. And Scoop says, he's good, but the hand that man was dealt in the league with Chicago was a mess. Uh, I, all Fields, I hear is the same level of, of excuse making that many of you were making for Malik. Stop. It's so different with Malik. He, I understand he it's came different into from the Malik. But Lucas, my premise project. is not is not that much different when you say to me he's a great athlete and a great football player he's just not a good nfl quarterback how the hell am i supposed to compute that sure he has not had the consistency to be a good nfl quarterback but don't act like watching justin fields play in the nfl his best moments compared to malik's best moments is even in the same stratosphere no but malik is the example that we have to tie to a local premise which is why i use sure it. but it's just too different like it's total apples and oranges like what is malik's best moment as a pro have we ever seen Malik do something in an NFL regular season game that said, okay, there could be something here? No. The answer is no. With Justin Fields, there's been those moments. There have. They're just not consistent but enough. Their runs, their explosive running plays when a, def when a defender blows an assignment, it's not like running plays that happen that way. It's kind of like the, the Derrick Henry premise. How often do, do those things get blocked up perfectly? Now, Derrick's also a special athlete, right? How often do explosive running plays, maybe Derek's a bad example, but explosive running plays in the NFL, how much of it is because a defender made a mistake, got out of his gap, somebody squirted through and went went for 65 yards as opposed to it being blocked up perfectly and everything going to plan and, and leading to an explosive running play? doesn't happen as often that way as you think. I We don't need to get bogged. He, he's, he's led Chicago to wins with his arm as well. Like, we're not watching the Bears every weekend, but Justin Fields has thrown for 250 in a win over the Lions where his completion percentage is high. He threw 16 touchdowns to nine interceptions. It's not good numbers, but there it feels like there's something there where, like, the Malik thing is totally, not to mention he's a top-10 pick. No, I'm not disagreeing with you on that. I'm not, I'm not out on Justin Fields the way that I'm out on Malik, but I just thought, that, like, the phrase... He's a great athlete and a great football player, but not a good NFL quarterback. Doesn't make sense when the position that he plays is quarterback, when he's not Taysom Hill. Anyway. Fields gets moved. Russell is there. The Steelers have, I don't know, a competitive football team. They will always have a competitive football team, it seems, as long as Mike Tomlin is there. How much does this impact the quarterback draft because now you have Minnesota who's got multiple first round picks who have the ability to trade up. You have Vegas creeping in the background, shedding Jimmy G's contract. I believe he signed with the Rams over the weekend. And the Titans sitting at seven with needs all over the place, left tackle most importantly. But it's not absolutely essential that they take the left tackle at seven. I am curious to see how all of this shakes out in the coming months, or I guess it's a little, little more than a month, about six weeks from the NFL draft. 
how this all shakes out and what becomes of Justin Fields. Because I would like to see, Pittsburgh feels like an ideal circumstance, right? For him. There's no pressure. The pressure's on Russ. The pressure's on Tomlin. The pressure's on Omar Khan, the general manager there who acquired both of these players. Two bad games from Russ, and that fan base is going to be screaming for Fields. And he, you know, Russ being polarizing doesn't help that fact because, I mean, we talked about it on, what, Thursday or Friday? I I compared Russ to socks for Christmas. Steelers fans are already not in love with the idea of it, but it's probably enough to keep them. They're going to win 10 games, whether it's with Fields or, or Wilson, right? We, we, we have, even, even in that division, we have confidence enough in the Steelers as a team that they should be able to gut it out, find a wild card spot in all likelihood. But that particular landing spot, with Arthur Smith, too, is the thing, because... Arthur Smith's, at least what he's done with Tannehill, what he tried to do in Atlanta, and he wasn't a good head coach in Atlanta, but he's still a good offensive mind. Russ's skill set does not really lend itself to what Art wants to do. So I'm wondering, Lucas, if if Justin Fields, by the time we get to week one, isn't the starter in Pittsburgh. Because I'm like like you're saying, I'm not I'm not completely out on him the way that I'm out on Malik at this time. Right, Malik. Maybe something happens in Malik's career where it's salvageable and he becomes a replacement level starter or a quality backup and and goes on to have a, a an extended career. It's a different situation for sure. Fields with Arthur, and given Russ and where he's dropped off the most at his age or at this point in his career. Kind of makes me think that Fields has as good a shot to be the week one starter, if not a better chance to be the week one starter than Russell does. I'm glad Justin Fields is getting this opportunity with an actually competent organization. Big Justin Fields guy, huh? I, I, I think Justin Fields can be successful as an NFL starting quarterback. So I'd like to see him get the opportunity to be without changing offensive coordinators every year and having a terrible situation around him. Uh, it's got to suck for Justin Fields to... Look back at Chicago, who is kind of building a quietly good roster. No, I mean, you remember Carm coming on at the uh, at the Combine and talking about this This is a legit roster. People just don't talk about it that way because yeah. the Bears have been inept for 10 years. Yeah, and Caleb Williams might actually be walking into a pretty decent situation if they can actually have continuity with the coaching staff and bringing in Keenan Allen to play opposite DJ Moore. They've been slowly building out that offensive line. Like, Caleb Williams quietly could have a good situation in Chicago, which Justin Fields did not at any point early in his tenure there. But I've seen Mike Herndon make the comparison of the conversation about Fields in Chicago to what it was with Mariota here near the end of his rookie deal. That's a good comparison. That is similar. Like, that's the comparison, not the Malik. Well, not not the Malik. No, I'm not trying to make a comparison to Malik. I'm just saying the way that you phrased it, Malik fits that prism. Mariota was was going to be okay until his fibula snapped. Yeah, yeah, it was much more injury That's a related. That's different. Like Marcus's body fell apart. Well, it's a, it's also easy to say that Mariota was going to be this great NFL starting quarterback before the injury. He's like, certainly an ascending player in sure. ways that Fields has yet to prove that he is. There, you could you can take pieces and parts from different scenarios. And this, by the way, this is the state of the league. It's why Will Levis getting an offensive head coach. I think is important because, I mean, if Art, I don't know if Art will ever be a head coach again, but if Art has some success in Pittsburgh over this season or a couple of seasons, goes on to be a head coach again. And Justin Fields is still the quarterback in in Pittsburgh for, for whatever reason. We'll see what happens with this contract situation. Isn't, isn't it a part of the job requirement for an NFL quarterback now to have to work through multiple offensive coordinators, through multiple systems. This is going to be the first time that Levis has had that kind of continuity since when? He has not had back-to-back years with the same offensive coordinator in his career since early days at Penn State. Right, so shouldn't this also be a part of the, like, when I I talk about Fields and, and Mariota, Marcus dealt with this to an extent, too, and there's been numerous quarterbacks, right, over the course of the league having to work through multiple systems, and it narrows down the pool even smaller than it already is. It's it's impossible to find 32 good NFL starting quarterbacks, I'm convinced. But it makes it even harder, the degree of difficulty, when this is a part of the, something that you're just going to have to expect. 
and it can derail these guys' careers very, very quickly. I, Trevor Trevor Lawrence is going to be a, a really interesting case study in this because he's got an offensive-minded head coach, but still Lawrence is, I mean, last year, and there were injuries, last year was a lost year for Trevor Lawrence, and he's on the precipice of getting paid. Okay, let's say in the in the last five years, when you think to quarterbacks taking the first round. Well, what, wait, wait, because of what time it is. Why don't we go through this exercise coming up next?
All right, so we're debating quarterbacks. And, Lucas, lay out for the audience the exercise that you want to take us through here because I've got the last five quarterback drafts year by year in front of me. So it was based off of what you said that at some point, quarterbacks just have to be able to deal with working through changing systems. Mm -hmm. And my argument, without looking at the QB draft classes in front of me, is that when I think of the best, most successful franchise quarterbacks that have been picked in the last five years, I think there will be a correlation between the best ones having that continuity and the ones that have had the least amount of success not. Like, off the top of my head, Joe Burrow, drafted into the Zach Taylor system with Cincinnati, has thrived since when healthy. Mac Jones, drafted into one of the most dysfunctional offensive situations in the NFL over the last four years or so, and has tailspin since his rookie year. Sure. But before we do this, isn't that obvious? Because Joe Burrow is not the standard. Joe Burrow is the anomaly here. Okay. Mac Jones is closer to normal. Quarterbacks don't hit the way that I think people expect them to. We we get ourselves in this mindset where because a quarterback has a certain pedigree and this position more than any other, for sure overdrafted oh absolutely and looking at the last couple draft classes at quarterback explains that too i'm talking about the ones that have hit i think for the most part we'll all have that in common okay so let's start with 18 you want to just do first rounders sure okay so in 18 five of them baker darnold josh allen josh rosen lamar baker mayfield you remember which coach, which head coach Baker Mayfield was drafted under? This is 2018. Oh, it's Hugh. Hugh Jackson. Yeah. And then Greg Williams, <laughs> yes. who was the interim head coach then. And year. then Freddie Kitchens. Yeah. Uh, Baker has is maybe the poster child for this roller coaster ride of an offensive coordinator, offensive system. Stefanski had the best, well, I mean, arguably, he had his best success with Dave Canales last year. Uh, the now head coach of the Carolina he, Panthers. He yeah, he the, had a career year. So we'll see what happens with Baker this year without Dave Canales because, of course, he got hired away. But Darnold, uh, your boy. Um, Adam Gase. Adam Gase. Bad situation. Mm -hmm. Josh Allen. Dayball got the best out of him. But he's a pretty he's a pretty big outlier in all of this. He Josh Allen is Josh Allen is at, to the point where if he doesn't have success, he is such an overwhelming athlete. The same way that Cam Newton was, he's almost able to overcome it and produce anyway. His team will win. They may not have the greatest success. They may not be good enough to get past Kansas City in a divisional round or an AFC Championship game. But Josh Allen almost feels like he's such a such an athlete, such a big time athlete in among the the world's well, not the world's best athletes, that's the NBA, but the the sports best athletes that you almost have to remove him from a system because he's he's a bit of Mad Max out there. You can win with Josh Allen because he's just going to figure out a way to bleep it and do it himself. Well, quarterbacks are always going to have to deal with change at some point, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if you have a good, long career, you're not going to be playing for the same head coach and offensive coordinator the whole time. The odds of that are very low. But you look at the very beginning of their career, and Allen had a good three years, right, with Brian Dable to get him out of the gates into his NFL career. Sure. And then from there, Josh Allen is a, is a veteran quarterback, and he's going to have to deal with change as it comes. And obviously they have, as far as the offensive coordinator in Buffalo the last couple of years. But he had that continuity early as a developmental guy out of Wyoming. Josh Rosen, you can nix because he was gone the next year. Lamar. This is another one. It's like Josh Allen a little bit different, but kind of the same. The thing, the biggest allegation that was lobbed towards Greg Roman, who's now the Chargers OC, was that they were not developing an advanced enough passing game Basically, that they were hindering themselves by not allowing Lamar to do more. And when Todd Munkin opened up the offense this year, Lamar has an MVP season. Now, he did have an MVP year uh, previously under Greg Roman. So it's not like you, you can completely discount Greg Roman 
as a factor here. And that was Roman's first year as the OC with the Ravens because he was a assistant head coach, position coach prior. Ooh, who was the OC for the Ravens? Because Flacco was still the starter until he got hurt. I don't know who the Ravens OC was in 2018 off the top oh, of my head. Marty Morningweg. Morningweg, who retired. Okay. So, but Lamar had Greg Roman for a period of time has been able to do great things, but are we attributing that to Greg Roman or Lamar? And you can't, you can't do one without the other entirely. It's not it's not a fair premise. But Lamar Jackson is more responsible for Lamar Jackson's success than is Greg Roman. And also Lamar landed in one of the most stable organizations in the NFL. Agreed, which is kind of like Fields going from Chicago, which is wildly unstable, yep. to Pittsburgh, where he can at least be on some solid ground and have... Somebody who's taken more of the uh, bows and arrows than he is in Russ. So 19. Kyler Murray, Daniel Jones, Dwayne Haskins. Now, Dwayne Haskins obviously not a part of this conversation um, because he has, he has since passed away. Um, Kyler Murray had continuity, and they fired the continuity. Yes. Is that Kyler's fault? Is that Cliff's fault? He did enough to get the contract. <laughs> so Cliff's fault. Daniel Jones is the Giants' fault. The Giants have oh. mismanaged him up and down, and he may not be the best quarterback in the world, and he may do some boneheaded things from time to time. Daniel Jones, of all the quarterbacks on these lists, save Josh Rosen. Daniel Jones has been done dirtier than anybody, anybody here. Not Zach Wilson, not... Uh, not, not Mac Jones? Not mm, Mac Jones is up there. I think they could be in the, <laughs> right next to each other, sitting next to each other at that table. On the recent first round quarterbacks that have gotten into the worst situations that Because he went from being a pro bowler to being a nightmare. A pro bowler as a rookie, Mac Jones. And Daniel Jones was always a guy that needed to land in a good situation. And the quarterbacks at the top of the draft don't land in good situations. True. Rarely. Joe Burrow, so now we're on a 20. Ton of continuity there. Tua, who had as big a dynamic shift from Brian Flores, who clearly, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say clearly, but sounds like he kind of hated Tua as a player and wasn't able to connect with him on the level that Mike McDaniel clearly has. And also there's a system that can help Tua be the best version of himself if executed correctly, and Tua does a good job at executing correctly. Who was his offensive play caller his first couple years in Miami? Because Flora is a defensive coach. Mm. I'm going to have to look this up. I want to say Bill Lazor. Tannehill had him for a minute, too. Uh, Chan Gailey in 2020. Okay. Career offensive coach. That was to his rookie year. Tua seems like he is going to be the beneficiary of consistent coaching. I mean, we we can go through this exercise if we want to, Lucas, but it's your premise is absolutely correct that continuity is going to help the quarterbacks most and that the outliers here are the guys that succeed, not the guys that fa failing as a first-round pick is the standard almost. I don't want to say the standard, but succeeding is the anomaly here. Who Has anyone succeeded to the level of Joe Burrow, Pat Mahomes? First round quarterbacks in the last five six years. Is there, who else could we put up there? Watson looked like he had a case, but yeah. that's since and Watson and Watson's best football came when he was drafted into the Bill O'Brien system and under the Bill O'Brien system. But nobody has had better continuity in terms of being drafted into the perfect situation well, oh, with okay. the perfect offensive minded coach no, 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 than I'll, Mahomes and Burrow. No, I disagree. Who you got? Purdy. Yes. What better What better example is there yeah. than Purdy? And that's where it's interesting because you get Lance as well, who was the top five quarterback, drafted into the exact same situation as Purdy. One has flourished and improved year after year. One is in Dallas and TBD. But that was also a weird draft. And I remember, what was your reaction to the Trey Lance stuff in that moment when Trey Lance is shooting up the boards Having played what one career game? Well, do you remember? You remember the discourse NDSU? around that the 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 biggest lie told that year. Shanahan was going to that they thought Mac Jones might go through. right. They were going to trade up for Mac. Now, 
Mac Jones might have been a better fit for what it is that Kyle Shanahan is trying to accomplish based on what the prototype Kyle Shanahan quarterback is. My reaction was, oh, he's going to get the best athlete that he's ever had at the position. If he fine-tunes it, San Francisco is going to be gnarly. Yeah. Because Lance had all the traits, right? Traits. This is the thing that people get. This is why quarterback is the most overdrafted position of any position. One, it's the most important position. So you understand that the runs are going to start earlier. You're going to have more first-round quarterbacks than you probably should in any given year. How much? How many of them end up succeeding? The, the hit rate is so, so, so small. But teams are willing to take a chance on Trey Lance because, and and they're not same, similar prospects entirely, but Josh Allen was under 50% as a passer at Wyoming, completion percentage. But an incredible athlete, right? So you got him in a, in a system in Buffalo. Brian Dable ended up being the right coach for him, and they improved Josh Allen markedly year over year. To the point where, yeah, he still has some YOLO stuff that stresses you out from time to time. And he's just out there being a menace when they can't run the football. He'll make a play. But that, as long as examples, like, it just takes one, right? It's just like the contract situation. It just takes one person getting paid for the the market to go crazy. It just takes one quarterback that's super traitsy, super athletic, to pan out for teams to continue to take that chance. And should they be faulted for that? I, I don't think so. Even I mean, they deserve Shanahan deserves to get buried for the Trey Lance trade in the way that it didn't pay, pay out and uh, play out. And I know he had injuries that set him back, consequential injuries that set him back. But I don't think NFL teams should be faulted for that. I think that's the I think that's the laziest criticism to say, oh yeah, that super that super talented athlete that you took at the top of the draft and you couldn't figure out how to do anything with him. You should never have done that trade. You fool. How could you not see that at the time? When, of course, we were all probably thinking the same thing. Oh, this is a really high upside player with the person who's regarded, save Andy Reid, as the best offensive mind in the sport. The thing about that draft that I remember is being mystified at how suddenly Trey Lance is shooting up as a top three pick, having hardly played any football in his life, when Justin Fields, who I just watched, lead Ohio State to the national championship game as a pocket passer. Mm -hmm. He was not much of a dual threat at all at Ohio State. Fall to almost outside the top 10. And I don't know if that was a case where maybe like Mac Jones, where just how good Ohio State was almost worked against fields. Because Mac Jones broke all two of his records at Alabama and then was the number 15 pick in that draft while Zach Wilson is going second overall. That felt like a case of overthinking the room at the quarterback position that year. Well, they didn't think it. They didn't think the Jets didn't think that through enough. It was Zach. Well, there was never any dis- yeah. disputing that Zach Wilson was going to be the second player off the board. Yeah. I remember being so mystified at, at the Justin Fields discourse that year after watching what we saw him do a guy who was a blue chip player out of high school. Didn't work out of Georgia. Just couldn't get past Jake Fromm, and then leads Ohio state to championships and, and a big 10 championships and a national championship game appearance was so crazy to me that a guy that played one game at North Dakota State was going to go three overall over that. 22. Pickett, he's the only first-round quarterback. He's already been traded. Desmond Ritter, second-round quarterback. He's already been traded. Malik Willis, third-round quarterback. If they could trade him, I, <laughs> I'm sure they wouldn't a heartbeat. And all three of those guys have not had the benefit of continuity by any means. Mm -mm. Matt Corral was the next quarterback off the board. UFL, he's not even in the league anymore. He got hurt immediately, immediately when he arrived in Carolina. Bailey Zappi, other than Purdy, Bailey Zappi might be the most successful quarterback in this class. No, Purdy is. No, no, after Purdy. Oh, gotcha. Because Bailey Zappi has at least started games and looked some level of competent. Yeah. Pickett, I mean, Pickett's got as many touchdowns as he did interceptions. He's He's got a winning record as a starter in Pittsburgh, but do we credit him for that or do we credit the Steelers organization and team for that? Willis, messy. It's just all so messy. And, and, I mean, there's there's not many people I feel worse for, and not that he needs my pity, not like he's, a, he's some kind of sob story or anything like that, but, like, I feel bad for Malik. Every, anytime I think about the situation that he's in, I just kind of feel bad for him. Because they, 
somebody who needed a variety of different things to go right to be the best version of himself at every turn felt like it went wrong, right? This is this is a long, drawn-out way for us to say how inexact the quarterback science is and how much, I think, even teams, not just not fans, not people doing PFF mock drafts or whatever, how badly teams overvalue these players and get ahead of themselves when a variety of different situations, you could probably make your team better by spending that pick on another player and putting a quarterback, a lesser quarterback, in a system or with better talent to try and Brock Purdy your way through this thing or Jimmy Garoppolo your way through this thing. Not spend that premium pick on a quarterback just because you need a quarterback. But trying to put the best possible team around him and not overvaluing that position as much as it seems like teams do. Doesn't that speak to the point here that the situation is just as critical? Oh, sure. That the most successful quarterbacks have been in the best situations? It is more important. It is more important than the talent. So so help me out with your stance on, look, you're going to go through coaching changes, like with Justin Fields. If you haven't proved it, you haven't proved it. Because I think that's a critical part of the conversation. Like, there should be a huge asterisk there. Like, yeah, but we're never going to have that level of nuance in quarterback discourse. It's going to be, can you win the big game or not? It's Ryan Tannehill's entire career. Can you win the big game? Should Ryan Tannehill have been a, a first-round pick? Yeah, probably. But... He's gonna be he's gonna be thought of as a career underachiever, even though he had a I mean, he's having a he's what, year fourteen for Tannehill coming up? Yep. That's a success by any measure. He's more successful than, than a lot of these quarterbacks who are already being moved. And he's survived a lot of that, made a career as being a starter through a multitude of situations. But Ryan Tannehill is thought of as career underachiever. It's just, I I always think it's so interesting to see how quickly we are to label that position without the context that we just had as a part of this discussion. And I don't know if there's ever a way to get teams to move off that that way of thinking where overvaluing quarterback is always going to be the thing because it is the most valuable. But it just seems like there's enough of a track record here that at some point somebody's got to stop the madness. 615-737-1045 is the number if you want to jump in. News out of the college uh, football world on Friday that we didn't get to. We don't even have the 12-team playoff yet, but we're already expanding to 14. We'll talk about it next.
Welcome back to the show. 615-737-1045. You can jump in if you want. Get to more on the Titans here in just a little bit. Uh, heard from Calvin Ridley on Friday. We carried that whole press conference live. You can uh, go check out the interview that we did with Calvin. He was really good. We enjoyed that. I thought the show was still going on after the Calvin Ridley interview, and then Lucas texted me and said, show's over, bud. Oh, my bad. Had uh, the Vol game on Friday, and, of course, that disappointing result against Mississippi State. We'll jump into this expanded college football in the Expanded college football playoff that is already being talked about as upcoming expansion here in just a second. Jason and Murfreesboro is next, though. Hey, guys. Hey. Uh, I just wanted to, I just want to ask you guys uh, what's your thoughts on the Mason Rudolph pickup? I just feel like there could have been a lot better uh, pick for a backup quarterback for us guys. Uh, thanks for the call. We're going to talk about Mason Rudolph tomorrow, I think. Um, is the direction that we're going to head with that. I don't know if they're going to do a press conference with him. Um, I haven't seen anything to that effect, but I don't know. You think they're, they don't they don't want to deal with another potential mentor gate since he's the most expensive uh, quarterback on the roster, which is still out loud funny to me. Well, they officially announced it two days ago, mm-hmm. but, I mean, he is a veteran backup. Mason Rudolph's played a lot of football. Yeah, played a lot of football last year. We'll, we'll get into it tomorrow. Um, so... All nine FBS conferences and Notre Dame, of course, as an independent, have agreed to the next college football playoff contract, which will begin in 2026 and get the sport to the 14-team field with guarantees for conference champions. This comes after the announcement that the playoff field would already be expanding to 12. So no sooner than we got 12, Well, we have 14. Now, 2026 is not that far away. It's 2024 already. Math is not that hard. But it is the least surprising thing in the world that they would not even get the 12 team, not even have the first 12 team playoff take place before considering expanding. And it sounds like getting expansion approved for the 14 team field. As a college football fan, I think that four, if I personally think that 14 is the right number. I understand why people don't want expansion this way. I understand why people wanted to keep it four, even though I knew that that was never going to be feasible. Lucas, when you saw this news, what was your reaction? Because this happened what right before the show on Friday, maybe Thursday night? Uh, you knew it was coming, though. Uh, yeah, this had been in the works. We had talked about the reporting that the SEC and Big Ten wanted first-round buys in the expanded, expanded playoff, not the 12 team that we're going to see over the next two years, but the 14-team iteration. Yeah, it, at this point, uh, we're, we're over the slippery slope. We're sliding down it. I understand that this was the direction we were headed in, uh, but for me, I'd like to stop at 12. And I was in favor of expanding to 12. Like, I think there's enough reason to expand to 12 past four, but I'm okay with stopping there. I understand that greed is not going to allow that to happen. And I just don't see a situation where we're not instituting a 16 team before the 14 team is played, right? Like, are we not going to be here in uh, 2026 before the 14 team playoff even gets played talking about, well, now it's 16 and just keep going from there. So it stinks. I, I don't like it. You're starting to see the SEC and big and big 10 really, grab control over because they've agreed to how the revenue will be distributed. They haven't agreed to a formalized contract on the, on the 14 team. Playoff, Correct. Just like, to be clear. Yeah. The format itself uh, has not been made official or finalized, but you're talking about the sec and big 10 getting more than everybody else in this. And in the ACC schools getting 13 million annually, I'm trying to find the number on, Okay, Big Ten and SEC schools will each be making more than $21 million, up from the nearly $5.5 million hmm. that schools in Power Five conferences are currently being paid. So in this 14 team, you've got SEC and Big Ten making over $21 million, all their member institutions. In the ACC, schools will get more than $13 million annually. In the Big 12, schools will get more than $12 million annually. Notre Dame is expected to get more than $12 million annually as an independent. 
Group of five schools' annual payments will increase to just under $1.8 million from the current $1.5 million. And I've heard people ask, why doesn't the group of five just break off and do its own thing? This is why. <laughs> because group Money of five schools are... is always the answer yeah. to your question. So it is just happening before our eyes, right? The SEC and Big Ten just kind of gaining control of the sport, pulling it in their direction. And I hope we don't get first round buys for either of those conferences. Uh, I would, I would, I would truly, I would hate that. I would hate that. But now the thing that I haven't been able to, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt no, you. I was pretty much done. Well, I just, the thing that I don't have an answer for, uh, or at least from the reporting that I've seen, what does this do to conference title games, conference championship games? Is there an impact there? No, not that I know of, because you, you would be talking about that would affect seeding and, and schools getting automatic bids, right? Like the NCAA tournament. Like mm-hmm. you figure that will be part of the format is conference champions automatically go to the college football playoff. Like the winner of the Big 12 will go to an expanded 14 team playoff no matter what. The winner of the ACC will get in no matter what. And there will be SEC schools like Alabama could be playing Texas in the SEC championship game, and both of them could be 11 and 1, and both of them know that they're in the playoff, and then from there it's just about seeding and about a, a ring. <laughs> yeah. No, it's more about the money than it is about the ring, clearly. Quote, anything else regarding format is to be determined. This is a very important step for the CFP, of course, and we do still have details to be finalized regarding the format. But I want to stress that the really good news is that football fans will continue to see the best teams in the country competing for the national championship on the playing field. This arrangement will also ensure the expanded access will continue to be in place. We firmly believe this is about the importance of a competitive opportunity for more programs and more players and more fans. We're pleased to be in the position that we're in. While we know we're still there's still more work to be done. That's from Bill Hancock, who is the executive director of of the college football playoff. Yes, don't, you're doing it for the fans, don't Bill. Don't lie to me, Bill. You're doing it for the fans. Don't lie to me. I This is for you, not for us. You know why I like Calvin Ridley so much right out of the gate? Because he didn't he didn't BS me when we asked him, why the Titans? Well, I wanted to be in Jacksonville, but the money was pretty good here. Like, okay, that's all you got to say. You don't, you don't got to coddle people. When you do one thing and say almost the complete opposite, it is going to undermine everything that you say moving forward. And I understand that that is the world that we live in and that these people, Bill, Bill Hancock is as much politician as he is executive director. It is a political role that he's in. But I, that they would, I mean, almost spit in fans' faces a little bit to say, no, this is for you. You don't understand. This is for you. Not the $21 million that member institutions of the SEC and Big Ten will make up from $5 million. Not the money. No, no, don't look at the money. God forbid we talk about money in college football when that's all the sport is soaked in. It's just disingenuous. 615-737-1045 is the number. Dirty Bird is in Laverne up next. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I just got a... I want to put this out there and see what you think. So I think that every conference champion should get a shot, for one. Two, they can use the bowl games for their money because they're going to want money. But three, it also solves – everybody wants to see an underdog get a chance. You always see that VCU or Marshall or some team 12-0, but they only get to like 13th or 14th. I'm not saying have it as big as the NCAA tournament, but you could use every conference champion, then, you know, put up maybe 10 at large bids, something like that. But that way, if there's a Marshall team that's 12 and 0, they get a shot to get in there and actually make some noise in that tournament. Also, the colleges get their money from the bowl games. I just think that going back and forth 12, 14, 8, 10, it's not going to solve the problem. Everybody's going to have a different opinion every year on how many teams should make it. But that's just my opinion. I just wanted to put that out there. Thanks, guys. Thank you for the call. We can continue to take your phone calls on this. Coming up next, the final hour, we'll also get into some college basketball because speaking of tournaments, we do have a bracket. Ron Slay will join us at 1230. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone.
It is 12.02. Good afternoon. I'm Lucas Panzeca from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. The bracket is out for the NCAA tournament, and the Tennessee Vols are the two-seed in the Midwest region. They take on St. Peter's Thursday night in 8.20 tip-off in Charlotte. The second-round matchup will be against the winner of the 7-10 game in the Midwest. Texas is the seven seed. They will await their opponent as Virginia and Colorado State will face off in a play-in game for that 10 seed. Eight SEC teams made the cut, tied with the Big 12 for the most by any conference. Auburn is a four seed in the East after routing Florida to win the SEC championship at Bridgestone Arena on Sunday. The one seeds are UConn, Houston, North Carolina, and Purdue. Spring practice started today in Knoxville for the Tennessee Vols. The orange and white game is slated for April 13th at Neyland Stadium. Free agency visits happening around the NFL. Chase Young is in New Orleans today. The Titans are hosting former Saints offensive lineman Andres Pete. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Final hour on this Monday. Welcome in. Thanks for hanging out with us. Lucas and I got you until one. We'll turn things over to Blaine and Mickey then. You got a chance to jump in if you want. 615-737-1045 is the number. Appreciate you guys bearing with me. Lucas, there's nothing that I hate worse than people who do broadcasts with like gum in their mouth or a cough drop, but I'm struggling after this St. Paddy's Day weekend. I'll be honest with you. What'd you do? Anything exciting? I know you were on the call for Saturday's Nashville SC win against Charlotte. That looked exciting. Very fun game. Schaffelberg, man. Uh, Excuse me. Schaffelberg did not score. He came in in the second half. Well, who? Uh, uh, who Surridge. Surridge. I think you're thinking of Sam Surridge. Wrong S. Sorry. Yes. uh, Sam Surridge gets his first MLS goal, his third goal in all competitions. So, yes, a bright start after his injury, a bright recovery from his injury for the designated player really fun game uh coach doug matthews was up there for the first time oh. he called me before the game told me he was going he came in and said hey in the booth uh i know robert walsh was there with cheyenne no, it was well, a star-studded that. affair at geodis park <laughs> but fun game man nashville fans delivered as always night games at geodis park especially when the weather's good the weather was good on saturday and it I got was a little awesome. cold it got a little cooler on saturday night yeah but it was uh it was a, a really really nice day uh to go out and catch some uh catch some soccer there but i swear that environment just improves every week but big to get their first mls win after being eliminated from Concacaf champions Cup. taylor h laughing at me because i confused the s's yes i'm sorry it happens super sam right super sam surge super sam He's, a, he's got a fun goal celebration. he got good energy. That whole team's got good energy. They do. They definitely do. Um, and I apologize to the fine people of Geodis Park for unleashing Robert Walsh after a full day on them. I don't know what that looked like in whatever area. He sounded like he was in a very, very VIP area that somebody like Bert has no business being in. My sources are telling me that Geodis Park is rethinking its all-you-can-eat policy in the Champions Club after Robert's visit. Uh, so hopefully he doesn't ruin it for everyone else. I heard, I heard they did some damage. Either way. <laughs> did you see him at all? I did not get to see Bert. I did not. I need to I need to show you that. I don't want to tweet it out because it's not it's not mine to post on social media. But it's a funny picture of Bert that I'll have to send you that was uh, in the full throes of St. Paddy's Day, uh, St. Paddy's Day's affair. I feel like most people celebrated on Saturday. Sunday people look like a little too hungover, not more green in the face than green in their clothing. Yes. Based on uh, my my experience wandering around town yesterday, but either way. Uh, we had Walker Zimmerman on for the pregame show, too. I saw that. And he crushed it. He was great. That's uh, So what's what's the deal? He uh, What's the latest on him? Uh, knee injury. Uh, he had a procedure done last week. Looking, Gary Smith has set a three- to four-week timetable, of which uh, a week of that will have passed, so they'll look forward to getting him back. But in the meantime, uh, yeah, loved, loved having him up there as our guest pregame analyst. A little bit of NFL news, probably not laser light show worthy, but Leighton Vander Esch is officially retiring after six years. Uh, middle linebacker with the Cowboys. Good career. Neck injury last season. Uh, Cowboys just released him. Th- wasn't he a neck roll guy? Yes, neck roll guy. Are, are the neck roll guys officially extinct in the NFL? 
Mm, no, Raidens is a neck roll guy. Ah, yes. Not all the time. I think that might have been injury specific, but he he does have a what are they called butter butterfly collars? I don't think they call him an outright neck roll anymore. Either way. This makes me happy. Kyle in the FNM Bank chat says, thanks for the soccer ticket, guys. I had a great time, brought my dad. He had so much fun, and we got to catch up. It's been a while. Oh, lovely. Just to warm your heart on a Monday. Well, that's what we do. Warm hearts. I mean, in my experience. What they say about us. <laughs> Just the most heartwarming show in Music City. <laughs> 615-737-1045 is the number if you want to join the discussion. Pivot back into some college basketball. We got the March Madness bracket released. Slay is fresh off a of flight. He'll join us in about 30 minutes from now. Uh, to the phones, RJ and Phoenix. It's been a while. What's going on, Buck? Lucas, how y'all doing, man? Good, my guy. Sorry if it's loud, man. I got a real job. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we, we appreciate you making the effort. So, listen. It's one reason the UT Bobs is going to the Final Four. It's because the Final Four is in Glendale, right across the street from my mama house. So that's lock that in. I'm going to see the Vols Final Four. Okay. I got a question, though. What, how is it that the play-in teams, how are they like a 10 seed if they win, but they're not good enough to just be in, so they have to play their way in. But the 16, 15, 14 seed, they in. They don't have to play in. I, I never understood. How is that? Why is that? It's a good question. I, I never know the rhyme or reason as to the teams that they decide have, I guess, having like an identical resume that get to fight for the 10th seed. Because occasionally you'll get a play in for the right to be the 16th seed. But for the most part, the 16th seeds are just automatic qualifiers, right? Or, or like Stetson who won their conference. So I'm going to take this from the uh, not no very well-noted resource, printyourbrackets.com. Okay. The reason that we see 11, 12, 13, and 14 seeds, which are at-large bids in the play-in games, is because when the committee ranks all 68 teams, the conference champions take up all of the lowest spots while the lowest-ranked at-large teams are up in the 11, 12, 13, and 14 seeded spots. I don't like that as an explanation. I don't know if that's true, but that's from printyourbrackets.com. So I, I can't, we can't accurately answer that for you, RJ. Hopefully the internet has not failed us there. Probably somebody more intelligent than us will call in and expand. Um, but quarterbacks, Titan signed one. We're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about Mason Rudolph more in detail tomorrow. Has Ramon gotten into? Because uh, obviously they were on the same team in Pittsburgh. Uh, Ramon and Mason Rudolph. Has he gotten into Mason Rudolph at all on the on the morning show? I haven't had a chance to hear. I imagine they've talked about it. I'm not. I haven't heard Ramon talk about it. Not not on the drive in this morning. They weren't. So before we have an expanded conversation about Mason Rudolph, the player tomorrow, were you? We we did not talk about him at all. Even though he was on every free agent list, you know, people, I think, more leaned into Dobbs for obvious reasons. Flacco is somebody that, I mean, I heard, I, I hadn't heard anything about Joe Flacco here, but he got a decent deal in Indianapolis. He did, and I that would have been, I think, Flacco or Jimmy G would have been my best case scenario. Flacco got more money in Indy than he did here, or than Mason did here. Yes, um, Mason Rudolph is an interesting, an interesting kind of player because I think, and I don't want to do the whole, the whole bit before we get to it tomorrow, but I think the way that people talked about the, how he played down the stretch was wildly overrated. I did not think that made Mason Rudolph redeemed himself in any great way down the stretch in Pittsburgh. I thought the Steelers were a Super Bowl contender, Buck. Well, they are because they're in the playoffs. You're the worst. Those are the rules. If you make the playoffs, you are a you are contending for a Super Bowl. Except you're not. You're not. <laughs> at no point, at no point were the Steelers a Super Bowl contender. Lucas, it's the literal definition of being sure. in the playoffs. It, it, it you sure is. You are a is. contender. It sure is, except they're not. They weren't. <laughs> they just weren't. So when... Uh, I don't know. Let's take a random college football team in the in the fourteen team playoff. So when JMU 
Yes. Makes when, the when college the football. Trendy upset pick uh, in March, by the way, James Madison. So when JMU makes it into the tournament next year in the expanded college football playoff. Oh, they play Wisconsin this week. You don't think that they'll be, a, you don't consider them a national championship contender, They're, even though they are by definition competing, contending for a national championship. That's actually the perfect, I appreciate you bringing up that comparison to show how wrong you are. So you are going to look people in the eye mm-hmm. and call James Madison a national championship contender. If they crack into the 14 team playoff, I mean, why wouldn't I do that with March Madness? Well, March Madness is different. Oh, now it's different. It's always been different. (laughs) Yes, thank you, Jim. I am spouting a common sense argument, not a technical argument. Listen, the whole the whole po- the whole point of sports, the whole reason sports is fun is because it doesn't make any damn common sense. Sports made any damn common sense, we wouldn't have jobs. You know what I'm saying? Like common sense in sport. I don't want common sense with my sports. Yeah, but the whole argument against or part of the argument against college football expansion is this isn't basketball. You're not going to get a fairly Dickinson upsetting Purdue in football. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> You're not going to get a Liberty knocking off an Alabama in the expanded playoff. Not going to happen. Hmm? We'll see. Take more of your phone calls coming up next. The hottest teams going into the tournament, plus Ron Slay. We'll catch up with the big fella. He's fresh off of days of television. We'll see if he still has any energy left for us. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone.
We got basketball starting Thursday. We're going to carry it right here on 104.5 The Zone. It's going to be electric. Vols play on Thursday late. You can hear that. Vol Network broadcast, uh, 8.20 Central Time, I believe, is the tip. Ron Slay going to join us here in just a little bit. We'll talk about the teams that are the hottest heading into March Madness. 615-737-1045 is the number. If you want to join the conversation, we'll go to the phones first before we dive in. Trey is in Nashville. Hey, Buzz, how you doing? Yo. Hey, I wanted to know, I read a report that uh, that said that Brock said that he was hurt, uh, that, that he has a lingering issue. That's why he didn't uh, participate in the combine. Would you still take him in the first round, or would you lay off that pick? And y'all have a good day, buddy. Thank you. Thanks for the call. Uh, so he did not participate in his pro day, did not Hamstring. participate in the combine. Hamstring injury for both him and Amarius Mims. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Football players get hamstring injuries. I wouldn't pass on Brock Bowers because he's got a um, a hammy injury. Yeah, and you know you never know how precautionary those things are. Like not like Brock Bowers needs a good pro day, but no. his only real injury concern in college was high ankle sprain. And he had the tightrope surgery on it. He came back as soon as he possibly could late last season. Otherwise, he's been a pretty healthy and available player for Georgia. Yeah, the the, the Bowers thing. I don't know. We'll have more time to talk about it. Let's let's focus on basketball since we uh, we've got plenty of time to talk about the draft with six weeks to go ahead of that. But we'll circle back at some point. Thank you for the call, Trey. Upset potential. So you asked me, and you know. I gave you an answer. You didn't like my answer. Who my first round upset was? You're just be. trolling. You're just trolling, Buck. Isn't that the point? What do I get? What? So what, what do I get? What's the point of it. upsets? I'm you not know. mad about it. <laughs> Use your inside voice. I don't think you have one. No, never have. <laughs> um, I did pick St. Peter's to bother Lucas. I'm glad that it worked. Upset wise, though, I I do have a legit one. I, I'm I'm not going to make a bracket, but if just kind of paying attention to the landscape of college basketball this year, I do I do think that there are a couple on the board that make sense here. Now I'll ask you the same question: If you had to pick a first round upset, one first round upset out of this sixty four team bracket, who would you pick? McNeese. Oh, you took mine. I over I, the Zags. I said this to you. Yeah, I don't listen to you. I brought up McNeese State. We had an exchange. I right? heard you I nothing. Said, I heard I no said, analysis about the Southland I, Conference. I, I heard nothing about the Cowboys themselves. I, I said. I heard nothing about Will Wade. I said McNeese State. Will Wade has had a great season, and you looked at me shocked. You said Will Wade coaches at McNeese State, mm-hmm. and I said yes, Buck. They're playing Gonzaga. We did this, you and me. I don't think that's true. Like an hour ago. Yeah, check the tech. But. That that's going to be a popular one. James Madison over Wisconsin is going to be a popular one. Uh, Grand Canyon could be a popular upset. Bryce Drew, man, Bryce Drew goes winless at Vanderbilt. No, not Bryce Drew, man. Bryce Drew goes winless at Vanderbilt, ends up at Grand Canyon, and has done nothing but win for the Jackalopes. Uh, also, my South Dakota State Jackrabbits play Iowa State as a fifteen-two matchup. Yeah. Might have to pull the trigger on that one. Go Jacks. Um, I also think that Texas has the ability to get upset in this bracket with Colorado State. Um, yeah, by who? Hmm? By who? I think that when you talk about this and the way that Texas is playing, not just because of the uh, not just because of the horns down situation that went viral and, no, I'm and it's easy to take shots. Upset by who? At Texas. Uh, I think... Where's the where's Texas? They're playing the winner of Colorado State, Virginia. Right, Colorado State. So is, if Virginia wins that, is that really an upset? I mean, 10-7, Virginia over Texas in the first round? Tony Bennett, national champion? Yes. Literally, it is an upset. A 10 over a 7 is an upset. Yeah, sure, by definition. I'm not giving you, you, an, you and your I'm not giving you, I'm not giving you a nine, an 8 over a 9 or a 9 over an 8. What do you, is it an... <laughs> Number 22, Virginia Tech knocked off number 19, Florida State, last week, and a huge upset, huge upset in the ACC. 
That's you. Oh, you're doing the mic, turn off mic thing? Yeah, you're going to do this now. Every time you get pouty because I push back on you, you're going to turn your mic and sit back and be quiet. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Oh, we're going to get an FCC fine for this. <laughs> That's as long as we've ever gone. Yeah. <laughs> I won't play your games. You just did. I won. <laughs> no, I uh, Texas and Colorado State, I think, is a, is an upset potential. Guess a 10 over a 7 is an upset. So what what is what is the what is the team that you feel the best about heading into the bracket? This year, because UConn, as you mentioned, as the number one overall seed in the East, has the toughest road to go uh, with Auburn in there, FAU with Iowa State. I think that, uh, I mean, Illinois is a problem. It, even in a down year for the Big Ten, they, I don't know, they, they didn't look great at any given point. But this is not a tournament with one clear and obvious team that I think can run away with it because they've slided the odds against UConn the way that they have. Honestly, and I know that they had a bad SEC tournament, but Kentucky, man, I can't help, I and it pains me to say because of how much I hate Kentucky and I don't want them to do well, but Kentucky making a run here, Makes a lot of sense to me. It's not like Alabama where just because they scored a 100 points on a couple of tomato cans throughout the course of the season, and they did do it nine, I think, nine total times throughout the course of the regular season. Kentucky is the team that I feel the best about, even though they're coming off a disappointing SEC tournament result. Not just because they beat the Tennessee the way that they did, but that team has the biggest upside Of any of the, I mean, they're not a lower seeded team, but of any of the teams who you might question the seeding around them, and with the first round matchup, I mean, they're going to get through Oakland. They they would it would be interesting to see a game between Kentucky or NC State, uh, between Kentucky and NC State or Texas Tech. But I I can't help if I was to make a bracket, I'd probably have Kentucky in the Elite Eight. 615-737-1045 615-737-1045 is the number. Ron Slay is going to join us here in just a minute, and we'll get his thoughts. He was uh, on TV all weekend long breaking down the bracket. I'm surprised we haven't gotten a call, Lucas, uh, from the guy that was after me about saying that Tennessee had a chokehold on the SEC after the way that the SEC tournament went. There's a lot of this stuff that with Tennessee – I'm just I'm just not sure what to do with that particular result against Mississippi State. And we open the show with it this way, looking around, and Slay will be able to come in here and, and explain more, expand more for us. How, how the hell you are here after getting off a plane not 30 minutes ago is incredible to me. God love you, truly. Like you, <laughs> Luke, uh, Lucas, turn his microphone on if you would. Um, I cannot believe... That you have done. How many straight hours of television have you been on? Because you were just on my TV this morning and last night. <laughs> yeah. It's quite a bit, but How are you, bud? I'm good. What's up with you, brother? Uh, not your basketball team. <laughs> it should be. No. You Okay. Not uh, after that. No. You, you Okay, now I know you're serious. You, you're taking off the sunglasses. Let me give you the rundown. I can't uh, see. His dog in here. It's like a freaking cave. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> been all these bright lights, and now I get in the cave. It's for the lighting. Uh, <laughs> I think that what you did or what they did on Friday mm-hmm. is as concerning a thing as I could have seen getting ready to start March Madness, even as I understand that the worst thing for a basketball team, Slay, mm-hmm. especially in that kind of setting, is time off. Okay. I mean, I mean, it's, you can go every which way with this. Um, my, my pushback would be the last time they did this, when they were, a team was unrecognizable to a coach, like Coach Barnes said they were. Do you know what they did? Mm. They lost to Texas a at Texas a by 16 points. Unrecognizable team, got punked. They ran off seven straight. 
and three of those wins were against top 25 teams and a five-point loss to Kentucky. And one of them was A&M at home. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, Missouri, Arkansas. But the other three was Auburn, um, Kentucky. They lost. Um, I forgot I forgot the whole list. But you look at it and the way they came with it, um, it was a it was a different a different team recalibrated. So I think that's what I expect from them this time. I'm honestly intrigued to see how they bounce back on this platform and guys that came back super seniors how they lead because one thing you don't want to do is leave a bad taste um, in people's mouths when you're leaving out in Santi and Josiah Jordan James. So interested to see how they bounce back and I'm Chris Lofton got the same kind of effect you got. Every time Chris Lofton is getting honored, they get routed. <laughs> Jersey retirement, Kentucky Don't routes them. Put that on me. Chris Lofton, SEC legend, they get routed. <laughs> I don't know what it is about you and Chris Lofton, but guess what? Both of y'all are both. both of y'all are legends. <laughs> I was going to say no, both of y'all no, are no, legends. No, no, don't do that. Don't put him in. Don't that. put him in the same in atmosphere. That rest <laughs> one, of two, like, one of the best athletes to ever play for the University <laughs> and of Tennessee. Me, that's right. <laughs> and Buck, baby. <laughs> but guess what, though? I just heard you talking about Kentucky. So this is my thing, Buck. What gives you that same energy about Kentucky to make them think, make you think that they would go on a run when throughout not only the SEC, one, two, and three go down, but across the nation? Yeah, no. Everybody well, loses. One, because the SEC is one of the best conferences, no if question. not the deepest conference in college basketball no doubt. this year. And you could push back on me if you think no, otherwise. No, I, I totally agree. So I think by nature of that level of competition, I think they're as te- – I mean, the SEC teams coming into this tournament are as tested as any team in the bracket. So yes. I'll, I'll take that on precedent, and I would give that as analysis for, for Tennessee, for, right. Uh, right. for everybody, right. I, for Auburn the same. So I think with that, though – the way that I saw Kentucky turn it on at the end of the season, and I know that they did not play that well in the SEC tournament. It was not; it did not look the same, and the defense is still mm-hmm. a huge question mark, and they can get got at any point. But when you can score at will the way that they can in a tournament like this, especially when the South looks the way that it does, I mean, what is the toughest level of competition that they would – Houston is obviously the toughest level yes. of competition that they would face, and Houston is a great team. Yeah. But I don't trust Duke this year. Right. I, I'm, I'm looking up and down – NC State is a competent team. I did not expect them to have as much success in the ACC as they did this Got year. Got hot at the right time. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and and kind of going through the list, I think they have the easiest route of any team or any bracket, any region. It just kind of – it because I don't want it to happen, it's going to happen because I hate <laughs> Kentucky that way. But I just – I can't look at the amount of talent that they have and discount them. Maybe I'm giving them more credit than they deserve. I just think when you, when you look at them um, – Yes, they should handle Oakland. I think that NC State or Texas Tech, Texas Texas Tech game that can prevent that can prevent some problems for them um, because of the physicality that they will play, the inside presence that both of them are going to bring. I think DJ Burns would be an asset for NC State because we still haven't seen an interior guy. We saw Big Ugo for Kentucky come through. Big Z has his flashes. Aaron Bradshaw had his flashes. Mitchell, the same thing, but nobody to stabilize Kentucky to give them an interior presence consistently on defense. And you got to win six games straight to get off on the run. So maybe he gets hot that game. Um, Outside of that one, Marquette. I think Marquette is getting overlooked. I don't think they're the Marquette that we saw early in the year, but I do think they've grown um, and Shaka Smart, we know with all the love we give Bruce Pearl, Shaka Smart does the same thing in tournament-type atmospheres outside of what he did at Texas as far as getting his teams ready to play. So I, I, do they have the easiest? I think they got the easiest path, too. I think Tennessee's path is kind of easy. Um, I would love to see them in the North Carolina bracket other than the Purdue bracket. I thought that would be a better matchup for them. But um, I, I don't see anyone just stunning Tennessee. When you look at Creighton, South Carolina, Oregon coming out of there. Um, Texas, I don't think Coach Terry and them present a a big factor as far as a a roadblock for Tennessee once Tennessee, if they get past St. Peter's and continue to move on. I think they got a good run at the Sweet 16 without question. Then it just depends who's coming out of the top top, uh, part of that pod. Not to to keep coming back to this, but the Tennessee-Mississippi State game, what was the most surprising part of that for you? Zero. No, no, and the reason being, I think no. This is no. and this is what I keep trying to explain to everybody, but they can't hear over the noise of it being the tournament and it's a game and right, well, they're out of up. it, they're disqualified. This is my thing. 
in the Friday rounds of the games, if you can name me one thing that was different in this matchup in the tournament atmosphere than what was different in the regular season when all of these teams played each other. It was the same thing for Alabama, Florida. Same type of same type of game. Florida really should have beat them three straight times. They went in overtime at Alabama. They let it slip away. Alabama got lucky, hit a shot. Boom, that's done. The other one was, um, who was it? Um, Kentucky. Kentucky and A&M. Don't forget, A&M beat Kentucky the same way at Texas A&M, and they were just now getting Boos Rafford back. But this wasn't the same, Slay. Like, this is, I I understand what you're saying. This was the same when Tennessee played at Mississippi State. They punked them then. Dalton Connect just got hot at the end and made the game look closer than what it was. And they had all the answers in the world for Connect in this game. Yeah, and the answer is a defensive end that's playing the wing and Cam Matthews, who <laughs> should have his hand in, in the dirt. Man. And then you got a guy, DJ Jeffries. They are a matchup problem. Look across the entire nation. You will never find two other spots that have two players like Cam Matthews and DJ Jeffries. I'm sorry. You just don't. Now, wait. And I, they didn't got see, the, I didn't see your pregame predictions. Did you pick Mississippi State over Tennessee? No, nobody in the world did. Well, then you can't tell me that it's not a surprise, that it's but, zero surprise. But, but No, but I, just, but I didn't circle them in. I didn't pin them in. Uh, <laughs> I didn't pin them in either. But this is my thing, though. See, I did say got BVS. it was a Even matchup. Even Slay's got a little bit of no, BVS. No, only with Mississippi State. But I said it when they went to the hump. Like, this is a bad spot for them. You know what I'm saying? With yeah. that matchup, I just believe, man, outside of Auburn, um, everybody else, the one, two, three, I'm missing somebody else. South Carolina. South Carolina played the exact same way when they went to Neville Arena. And got blown out. What happened in this? They got blown out. It's just, it's matchups, man. And when you get to this point in tournament style play, you throw scheme strategies, all that out the window. It's mano a mano, and you got to come with it. They wasn't able to come with it because of the way Cam Matthews. Now, I'm going to tell you this talking to some scouts, this is the scary part. This is the type of athletes that Don Connect is going to play against next year in the league. So it's even more. <laughs> this this tournament means even more for him as far as coming out and delivering, have going out with a bang. It, scouts won't have it about that. Ron Slay is here with us. TV zone. You can see him on the SEC network. You can hear him on 3HL from three to six. It's tournament time, so you know. Look at all my papers Slay, over here, Buck. I got I a lot of analysis and well, that's stuff. Because you've been carrying man. them around in a briefcase for a week and a half. <laughs> so we knew that Mississippi State was was a tough matchup yeah. for Tennessee. But my problem, Slay, is. I don't know that they would have beaten anybody that they shared the floor with that night the way they were playing. Like yeah, the, the way they shot the, the ball. The way they were shooting. The, the, mm-hmm. the silly turnovers that yep. just hadn't been happening. All Like at the very end of the first half, felt like a perfect example where Dalton Connect looking to get the final shot off of the half, get a quick bucket, trim the lead down going into the break, and just a lazy dribble over don't halfway agree. line. Turnover, pick six, right? He runs it back for a layup. I'm that that Tennessee team. I think would have lost to. I'm looking up and down. The, the anybody South Dakota State uh, Wagner, yeah. Dayton, Colgate, Drake, right? Anybody, Dr- yeah. Definitely Drake. Yeah, yeah. I, I, Even I, I my St. Peter's that. Peacocks. <laughs> yeah, they, at that time, yes, they would have lost to them. Mm-hmm. But that I, I put bunny on that one. Um, this is my thing, though. You're right about that, pan, and I, that's why I keep saying the SEC tournament is the best dress rehearsal um, to get ready for the NCAA tournament. Nothing presents more playing in a big space arena. You're playing with the new Wilson balls. You're playing you, You're playing with different people in the crowd, different type of lineups, different kind of type of strategies, different kind of type of physicalities. The way they officiated that tournament is how it's going to be officiated in the NCAA tournament. So if you walk in and thinking, all right, man, we're going to knock these down and get on that, that's not how it's going to go. It's a physicality that you got to bring to the game. And they didn't match that. I thought that was the easiest part. You got dominated in the paint. Dominated. So while you were missing and airballing threes, they were going down getting layups and dunks. That's not going that's not gonna fly when you get to the NCAA tournament. So I do think it was a bad game. I do ever expect Zakai to start hitting the top of the backboard when shooting threes. I don't. And I as much as your offense is not supposed to dictate how your defense is played, it did in that game. You saw the Zakai going to the bench, slapping the slapping the chair. You ain't never seen that type of frustration from him. He's the catalyst for this group. He got to keep his head right, and they'll be able to push on. But you need those uh, fifth-year seniors to step up. Ron Slay's in the building. Simple! 3HL 3-6. to six. Uh, Are you going home? Are you, what are you, what are you doing? You're right here. now? Yeah. I um, mean, we have another segment. I don't want to keep you. i hang with you. Okay. More Slay. I'm going to switch cars.
below MSRP, below MSRP, below MSRP. It's pretty simple. Two Rivers Ford sells all new non-specialty Fords below MSRP.
Ron Slay's in the house. March Madness is officially upon us. The Vols will play on Thursday, 820 the tip. That's right. You want to take some phone calls? Bring it on! We got some people want to talk some SEC Why my hoops. computer ain't on? I don't know. That's above, well, my, I don't know. That's above my pay grade. <laughs> Blaine usually has somebody come in here and turn it on for him. Where's that? Stuff? That's that. That's it. <laughs> floating around here somewhere. That man has more nicknames. <laughs> he does. See, I gave him that. Then Blaine and, and Mickey switched it up. Bananas. Yeah, Joey they, bananas. They, yeah, I don't know. maybe that's a pan thing. <laughs> I don't know who knows. I, I have <laughs> nicknames for him, but I can't say them on SEC. <laughs> <laughs> He's not listening to me. Jared and Mount Julie is next. Hey, Jared. How's it going, guys? Good. What's up, Jared? Hey, so really enjoyed the uh, SEC tournament. Uh, loved watching my Auburn Tigers uh, laid out there for uh, the city of Nashville big four crowd, games in a big row. Auburn and, crowd um, yesterday. Oh, huge, huge! Screamed my lungs out, and it landed us one of the uh, lower four seeds. I mm-hmm. am absolutely stunned. How do you go into a tournament like that? Uh, Thirty point win and a twenty point win in the championship game, uh, and then go backwards. Uh, they sent Alabama. Auburn and UAB mm-hmm. all to Spokane, Washington. How? Oh, your phone lights oh, terrible. Come on, Jared. But uh, his his point is well taken. So yeah. I I thought Auburn being seated that low after winning the conference tournament was criminal. Yeah, that's disrespectful. Um, and, and they the committee got to fix that. I don't know who he needs to get snubbed, but it can't be Auburn. Um, it can be a, a tournament, conference tournament champion, and one that hovered about g- around getting the regular season championship. I think what was more disrespectful than sending them to Sp- Spokane was putting them in the same pod where it was three of the Final Four teams in that pod: San Diego State, FAU, and UConn. Miami's the only one missing. How do you put Auburn in that pod? Like <laughs> that's that's bananas to me right there. So. I, I don't understand what um, what went about as far as forming that, but that was wrong. And, and one person that, that lives on motivation from disrespect, Bruce Pearl. So it's already out there. You know what he's going to play. <laughs> I, I expect him to move right along to the Sweet 16 with no question because of that. I uh, It's the only thing I've ever wanted from Don Davenport in my life is Bruce Pearl. <laughs> yeah, that's it's, it. It's the only thing that give, me, I've ever give me Pearl. Give me uh, Pearl. Not uh, Hugh Freeze or nothing like that? No, I'm going to keep you free. Although, I mean, no, it's, I still wouldn't pay attention to Indiana football. Um, out of the SEC, yeah. Duke, mm-hmm. this year, Duke fans everywhere, less and less these days, uh, it seems, they were disappointing, not just in the conference tournament, but throughout the course of the regular season. Yeah. They come into March Madness, their first round opponent, um, Vermont, not something that I think that they can't withstand. But what do you make of this Duke basketball team? Because this is this is one of the bigger curiosities. People are gonna, you know, people pick pick brackets by mascots and things like that. So yes. Duke is gonna end up being in some in some people's brackets for no other no other reason than their brand. Yep. But what is this Duke team actually? Because I'm kind of confused when I watch them. Yeah, uh, a team that I think is searching for identity. Um, a lot of times they're able to get behind their coach or, like you said, their brand and scare team walking in. Well, where parity is with Coach K walking away the way he was ousted as far as North Carolina beating them, like the the big shadow isn't there. The big bad shadow of Duke isn't roaming anymore. I thought Roach was a is a really good player. Um, you, you look in some of these situations, Buck, it's a reason why people come back. You know what I'm saying? When you hear all the NBA hype and this guy leave and, yeah, NIL, you can lean on that, but it's a reason they're coming back, folks, because they're not that good to play on that next level because if you are, you're automatically out of there. Um, When you come back, you try to mix those guys with the fifth-year guys, the COVID guys, and then big-name guys like Filipowski coming in trying to figure himself out. It's tough, man, and sometimes guys, (laughs) they kind of wither under that responsibility, and I think this is the time what you're getting with Duke. I think they get a they need a whole new spread to come in. Now this next class, Will Chain with Cooper Flag and those guys coming in, they will I believe go back to the Duke of old. But this group right here isn't who they're supposed to be. Dawn has already texted me saying, "Stay away from Bruce." IU fans <laughs> have such an inflated sense of self. It's true. <laughs> I've got Tom Crean out here caping up for teams participating in the NIT when I very distinctly remember Tom Crean declining the opportunity to host the NIT at Assembly Hall because they didn't want to sully the court there. You got to love it. That's just such a hypocrite. I can't. I don't want to say anything nasty. I know he's a friend of 3HL. Um, (laughs) 
quickly though, o- yeah. outside of the tournament, mm-hmm. Stackhouse fired. Yeah. Vandy, I wanted them to win that Arkansas game so badly. Me too. When that went to overtime, and that didn't mean he was going to keep his job, but right. still. And it does, you know, I don't know that the thing at Vandy was an outright coaching problem, though there are definitely some correlations to be drawn there. That is a job that used to matter, and I don't know what you do with it. I don't know who makes sense for that job. What do you do if you're Vanderbilt basketball as you see it, Slay? Man, uh, you got to open up that pocketbook. You got to get in NIL. And in order to compete in this league to where the league is going, you're going to have to lower the standards, the academic standards, a smidget for these guys to be able to get in. Not necessarily the guys you're going to get out of high school that you can develop, but the transfer portal is a real thing. People that you want to get, dogs that you want to get to come in there, the grades may not line up with what Vanderbilt is used to. Maybe you need to have meetings with Northwestern and Stanford and people like that to see how they do it. But in the SEC, the entire bottom, the entire bottom buck got better and raised up. Usually the top has to wait a little bit. The top kept going. The bottom is trying to catch up with the top, and that's what you get. Missouri is not going to be like that next year. Arkansas is not going to be like that next year. So you won't have them to lean on. You got to open up some man, to get players in there. And um, the fan base is there. I will say that. They're going to support. I know. Which is why I hate it. Yeah, I do too. I don't know who you bring in with Texas and Oklahoma coming in next year. It's going to be even tougher. Oh, my God. They got their work cut out for them. I'll tell you that. Work is cut out for. I can hire Dusty May since I use keeping Woodson. I tell you what, you wanna you wanna really shake things up and show people that you you going to be a dog and compete in the SEC. Go get Will Wade after this McNeese State run. Mm. Go get him. <laughs> you, strong he know how to navigate it. At he know how to navigate this. We love to see it. Uh, if we'd have done polls today, they would have been presented by Two Rivers Ford. Slay is on three HL from three to six. Thank you for coming in. No doubt, baby. Later, Mickey. They got you next.